Now we'll discuss a function which is a close companion of greatest integer function and that is fractional part function. Now fractional part function is defined as fx equals and we'll use these brackets, curly brackets to define fraction part of x and in the standard text they'll always mention this bracket they represent fractional part function. Now we have already studied that I can express any number x as its integral part plus its fractional part. Now integral part is greatest linear function. Now this fractional part is actually a fractional part function. So I can write any number x as sum of its integral part plus its fractional part. So now here we are interested to find its decimal value which is positive and which lies between 0 and 1. So suppose I have fractional part of 1.2 so it is 1 plus 0.2 so 1 is its integral part and its fractional part is 0.2 so fractional part function of 1.2 is simply 0.2 in the same way suppose I say fractional part of 2.7 it is simply 2 plus 0.7 so this is 0.7 what about 3 so this is 3 plus 0 so there is no fractional part so this is simply 0 what about pi so pi is 3.14 something so this is 3 plus 0.4 but how do I write 3 plus 0.4 so what I'll actually do is what I know is pi is greatest of function of pi plus fraction part of pi now greatest of function of pi is 3 so from here I can say so from here I can say fraction part of pi is simply pi minus 3 so cleverly what I have done is I'll remove this 3 I'll subtract this 3 and all I'm left with is its fraction part so fraction part of pi is simply pi minus 3 what about negative numbers suppose it is minus 1.2 so we have already studied in greatest linear function so this is minus 2 plus 0 0.8 so there will be 0 0.8 minus 2.7 so there will be minus 3 plus 0 0.3 so there will be 0 0.3 what about minus 2 so it will be minus 2 plus 0 so it will be simply 0 and what about minus 5 minus pi is minus 3.14 so what I know is minus pi is fraction part of minus pi plus greatest linear function of minus pi and greatest linear function of minus pi is simply minus 3.14 so there will be minus 4 so in this case fraction part of minus pi will be 4 minus pi so this is how we can define fractional part function now clearly by looking at the definition we know that this fraction part function should always lie between 0 and 1 so it should be positive and it should always be less than 1 so it cannot take a negative value and it cannot be 1 or greater than 1 so range of fraction part function is its value should always lie between included 0 to not included 1 so this is how we can define fractional part function now, if you want to draw the graph of fractional part function, we know that when suppose x lies between 0 and 1, now in this case, this x itself is a fraction, right? Its value is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So in this case, its fraction part of x is simply x. So if I have to draw this graph, so what I'll do is, I'll draw the x's. So between 0 and 1, this is simply y0 to x line. So this is simply x. Now what if when x lies between 1 and 2? Suppose x is 1.2. So what is fraction part of 1.2? Fraction part of 1.2 is simply 0 0.2. Or I can say it is simply 1.2 minus 1. Or in other words, I can say if x lies between 1 and 2, then x is greater than function of x plus fraction part of x 
between 1 and 2, greatest function of x is simply 1. So in this case, fraction part of x will be x minus 1. So if I draw this graph, I'll get this line. Now again for the next one, if x lies between n and n plus 1, where n is an integer, so in this case, x is greater function of x plus fraction part of x. So fraction part of x is simply x minus, now greater function x value will be n. So it will be simply x minus n. So if I'll keep drawing this graph, so that is the graph of y equals fraction part of x. And from the graph, we can again see that this value, fraction part of x value will always lie between 0 and 1. And also that this graph is a periodic function because this pattern, it repeats itself after every one unit. So this is a periodic function. And its fundamental period is one unit. So that is the graph of fractional part of x. Now the third property is fractional part of x plus n is simply fractional part of x if n is an integer. So basically when I say it is fraction part of x plus n, suppose I say what is fraction part of 0 0.2? So that is 0 0.2. What about 1.2? So there will be again 0 0.2. What about 2.2? So that again will be 0 0.2. So I am not interested in its integral value. So integer cannot change its fraction part. So if it is fractional part of x plus n, there will be simply fraction part of x. Suppose I have fraction part of x plus 2. I will simply write it as fractional part of x or even I have fractional part of x minus 5. I will simply write fractional part of x because fractional part of x plus n is same as fractional part of x. Now the fourth one is, suppose I have fractional part of x plus fractional part of minus x. Now in this case, it will be 0. When x is an integer, it will be plus 1 when x is not an integer. Now. If I take the first case, when x is an integer, now say, let x is n. In that case, fraction part of x will be fraction part of n. So there'll be no fraction part, it'll be zero. In the same way, fraction part of minus x will be fraction part of minus n, which again will be zero. So if I'll add them up, I can simply write fraction part of x plus fraction part of minus x will be zero. So when x is an integer, this value is simply zero. Now, when x is not an integer, then let x lies between n and n plus 1. So, what I know is x is greatest inter function of x plus fraction part of x. So, this is x and greatest inter function of x is simply n. So, this is n plus fraction part of x. So, I can simply write fraction part of x is x minus n. Now, what about minus x? If I multiply it with minus, I know minus n is greater than minus x is greater than minus n plus 1. So I can write minus x as greater function of minus x plus fraction part of minus x. So this is minus x and greater serial function of minus x will be minus n plus 1 and plus fraction part of minus x. So I can write fraction part of minus x as n plus 1 minus x. So if I add them both up, so x will cancel, n will cancel, I'll simply get fractional part of x plus fraction part of minus x and this value is equal to 1. So if it is an integer, then the value is 0. If x is not an integer, then the value is simply 1. So now we know that the value of fraction part of x should lie between 0 and 1 and secondly, any fraction part of x it's a periodic function with fundamental period 1. So now let us take a question. Say for example, I need to solve. The question is 3 times fraction part of x square minus 10 times fraction part of x plus 3 equals to 0 where this bracket represent fraction part function. Now what I'll do is I'll let this as y. So let fraction part of x is y. I'll get this as 3y square minus 10y plus 3 equals to 0. So this is 3y minus 1, y minus 3 equals to 0. So value of y is either 1 by 3 or 
the value of y is 3. Now, I know that fraction part of x is either 1 by 3 or fraction part of x is simply 3. Now, fraction part of x, its value will lie between 0 and 1. So, it can never take the value 3. So, I will not get any solution from the second case. Now, what about greater than the function of x? What about fraction part of x equals 1 by 3? Now, here, what could be the solution? x could be 1 by 3 or x could be 1 plus 1 by 3 or it could be 2 plus 1 by 3 or even minus 1 plus 1 by 3. So, it can be any integer plus 1 by 3. So, I know that because it's a periodic function with fundamental period t equals to 1. So, its solution, general solution is x equals to n plus 1 by 3 where n is an integer. So, answer to this question is the value of x should be n plus 1 by 3 where n is an integral value. So another question is, we are given a function fx, which is fraction part of x upon 1 plus fraction part of x, and I need to find range of this function. So what I'll do is, I'll write it as y. So this is y. This is fraction part of x upon 1 plus fraction part of x. So I'll cross multiply, I'll write it as y. And this is y into fraction part of x into fraction part of x. I'll take it on the right hand side. I'll write fraction part of x, 1 minus y equals y, so which is fraction part of x is y upon 1 minus y. Now, I need to find the range of y. So, what I know is this fractional part function, it has some restriction and the restriction is its value should always lie between 0 and 1. So, when this value lies between 0 and 1, what I know is this expression which is y upon 1 minus y will always lie between 0 and 1. Now, I need to solve this inequality and then I can have my range of this function. So, first part is y upon 1 minus y is greater than or equal to 0 and second part is y upon 1 minus y is less than 1. So, if I solve it, I'll get this is what? This is 0 and 1. Rightmost is minus. So, minus, plus and minus. I need plus. Now, 0 in the numerator is included and 1, it is excluded. And for the second part, I'll write y upon 1 minus y minus 1 is less than 0. So, I'll write it as 2y minus 1 upon 1 minus y less than 0. So, if I solve it, I'll get this is what? 1 by 2 and 1, minus, plus and minus, I need minus. So, either less than 1 by 2 or greater than 1. And because it doesn't have an equality sign, so it will be an open circle. Now, it is an end, so I need to take the intersection of these two conditions. So, if I take the intersection, then I can write it as, so first one says, the value of x should lie between 0 and 1. And the second one says, either it is less than 1 by 2 or it is greater than 1. So, the region which is common to both the conditions is y belongs to included 0 to not included 1 by 2. So, uh, the range of this function is the value of y should lie between 0 and 1 by 2. Now, the fifth property is if h is very small number which is nearly 0, small positive number then fractional part of h because this value will lie between 0 and 1. So, this value will simply be h. And if it is fraction part of minus h, then it will be 1 minus h. So we use this property when we solve questions in limits. Say for example, suppose I have this question which is limit x tends to 0 sin fraction part of x upon fraction part of x. Now because I know it's a fraction part function and fraction part function is discontinuous at 0. So I need to take left hand limit and right hand limit separately. So I write left hand limit and I'll also write right hand limit. So if I write left hand limit, I'll write limit x tends to 0 negative sine fraction part of x upon fraction part of x. So what I'll do is I'll let x as 0 minus h. So I can write limit h tends to 0 positive and this is sine fraction part of minus h upon fraction part of minus h. Now, what I know is when h is a small positive number, then fraction part of minus h is simply 1 minus h. So, I'll write it as limit h tends to 0 positive. So, this is sine 1 minus h upon 1 minus h. So, if I'll put the value of this h, I'll get this as what? I'll get this as sine 1 upon 1 and which is not an indeterminate form. So, the value of left hand limit simply will be sine 1. Now, what about right hand limit? Now, in case of right hand limit, I'll write it as limit x tends to 0 positive sine fraction part of x upon fraction part of x. 
so I'll write let x equals 0 plus h so there will be limit h tends to 0 positive sign fraction part of h upon fraction part of h now when h is small positive number fraction part of h is simply h so I'll write it as limit h tends to 0 positive so which is sign h upon h so if I'll put the value I'll get this as 0 upon 0 which is indeterminate form so now it becomes standard limit so value of right hand limit is simply 1. Left hand limit is sine 1 and right limit is 1. So left hand limit is not equal to right hand limit. Therefore, limit does not exist. So the question is limit x tends to 0 sine inverse 1 minus fraction part of x into cos inverse 1 minus fraction part of x upon under root 2 fraction part of x into 1 minus fraction part of x. Now because again this question involves fraction part function and I know that this function is discontinuous at 0. So I need to take two cases separately. So first I'll write left hand limit. So left hand limit simply will be limit x tends to 0 negative. There will be sine inverse 1 minus fraction part of x cos inverse 1 minus fraction part of x under root 2 fraction part of x into 1 minus fraction part of x. So I'll let x as 0 minus h. So I can write it as limit h tends to 0 positive sine inverse 1 minus fraction part of minus h cos inverse 1 minus fraction part of minus h and then root 2 fraction part of minus h into 1 minus fraction part of minus h. Now I know that Fraction part of minus h when h is small positive number is 1 minus h. So I'll put this value. I'll get it as limit h tends to 0 positive sine inverse. And this is 1 minus and it is 1 minus h. And it is cos inverse 1 minus 1 minus h. And then it will be under root 2 into 1 minus h and it will be 1 minus 1 minus h. So here 1 will cancel, here also will cancel and here also will cancel. So I'll get it as limit h tends to 0 positive and there will be sine inverse h into cos inverse h into under root 2 1 minus h upon h so now when i see this sine inverse h upon h it is 0 upon 0 form it is standard limit 1 cos inverse 0 so cos inverse 0 is simply pi by 2 and here if I put h at 0, I'll get this as root 2. So my left hand limit will be pi upon 2 root 2. So left hand limit for this function will be simply pi upon 2 root 2. Now if I look at the right hand limit, I'll write it as limit h tends to 0 positive sine inverse 1 minus fraction part of x cos inverse 1 minus fraction part of x under root 2 fraction part of x into 1 minus fraction part of x. So now I'll let x as 0 plus h. So I'll write limit h tends to 0 positive sine inverse 1 minus h cos inverse 1 minus h upon 2 h into 1 minus h because we know that fraction part of h is simply h when h is a small positive number. Now I don't have a problem with sine inverse 1 minus h because in this case it will be simply sine inverse 1 which is pi by 2 and I also don't have a problem with 1 minus h because here it will be 1. So what I do is I'll write it as limit h tends to 0 sine inverse 1 minus h upon 1 minus h and I'll also take this root 2 out and I'll write it as cos inverse 1 minus h upon under root h. Now this limit is finite, this value is finite and it is in indeterminate form. So if I put h as 0, cos inverse 1 will be 0. So it is 0 upon 0 form. So I'll write it as sin inverse 1 which is pi by 2. This is 1 and this is 1 by root 2 and I'll solve this limit as limit h tends to 0 cos inverse 1 minus h upon under root h. Now because it is 0 upon 0 form, I use L hospital rule. So I'll differentiate. So if I'll differentiate, I'll write it as pi upon 2 root 2 limit h tends to 0. So this is minus 1 upon under root of 
1 minus 1 minus x whole square and then for minus h it will be minus 1 and here it will be 1 upon twice under root of h. So I will write it as pi upon 2 root 2 limit h tends to 0. So if I take it on the numerator I will write it as twice under root h and here I will write it as 2h minus h square. So if I will solve it, so under root h will cancel, the value of h will be 0. So here root 2 will also cancel, so I will get this limit as pi by 2. So here left hand limit is pi upon 2 root 2 and right hand limit is pi by 2. We will come back to the periodicity of fractional part function. Now fractional part function as we know, it is a periodic function and its fundamental period is 1 unit. So this periodic property of fraction part function, it is very important for solving equations and inequality type problems. Now we will we'll look into the periodicity of this function a bit. So I will take up an example, say for example, suppose I need to find the period of the function fx equals 3x minus greatest integer function of 3x plus 2 m plus 10 pi x by 3, I need to find period of this function. So what I know is, I can write greatest integer function of 3x plus 2 as 3x minus, so this is greater function of 3x and then I can write plus 2 separately, plus 10 pi x by 3. Now 3x minus greatest new function of 3x and then plus 10 pi x by 3 and then it will be minus 2. Now x minus greatest new function of x is nothing but fraction part of x. So this is fraction part of 3x plus 10 pi x by 3 and then plus 2. Now what you know is fraction part function, it is a periodic function with fundamental period 1. And because here the coefficient of x is 3, so its period will be 1 by 3. And for 10x, its fundamental period is pi. And here the coefficient of x is pi by 3. So if I divide it with pi by 3, here the fundamental period is 3. So fundamental period for this given function will be LCM of t1 and t2. So there will be LCM of 1 by 3 and 3. So which is LCM of 1 and 3 and HCF of 3 and 1. So LCM 1 and 3 is 3 and HCF is 1. So the fundamental period for this given function is simply 3. Fraction part of x, fraction part of x plus 1 by 3, fraction part of x plus 2 by 3 and I need to find fundamental period for this given function. Now what do you know? Fraction part of x, its period is 1. For x plus 1 by 3 also, its fundamental period will be 1. And for third one also, its fundamental period will be 1. So if I take the LCM of these three, then the period of the given function will be LCM of t1, t2 and t3. So there will be simply 1. But now in this case, we know that its period is 1. But is it its fundamental period? That's what we, we need to find out. So what you know is here this x it is displaced by 1 by 3 and then 1 by 3 is displaced by 2 by 3 and if I let 1 by 3 again to 2 by 3 it will become x plus 1. So what I'll do is I'll try and see if I can get the result of f x plus 1 by 3. So I'll replace x with x plus 1 by 3 I'll write it as x plus 1 by 3. Now here 1 by 3 plus 1 by 3 will be 2 by 3 and here I can write it as x plus 1 by 3 plus 2 by 3 here will be fraction part of x plus 1. Now fraction part of x plus n is simply fraction part of x. So I can write it as so this is x plus 1 by 3 this is x plus 2 by 3 and this is fraction part of x which is nothing but fx. Now when we know fx plus t is equal to fx, then t is a period of this given function f. Now in this case, the value of t that I am getting is 
1 by 3 which is less than 1. So fundamental period for this function is not 1 but the fundamental period for this given function is 1 by 3. So this function is periodic and its value is 1 by 3. So now the obvious logical question is how is this periodic property of fraction part function is related to its equations and inequalities. So suppose I have any function which is f fraction part of x and which is equals to 0. Now when we know that any equation which just involves fraction part of x and no other function in that case what I'll do is I'll take the value of x between 0 and 1. So between 0 and 1 fraction part of x will be simply x. So I'll replace fraction part of x with x. So I'll solve this equation fx equals to 0 and I'll find its answers suppose x1, x2, x3. Then I'll choose all the answers that will lie between 0 and 1. Suppose x1 and x2 they lie between 0 and 1 and suppose all the values they lie outside this interval. So here I'll write x is equal to x1 and x is equal to x2. Now this result it is when the value of x lies between 0 and 1. Now because fraction part of x it's a periodic function with fundamental period 1 then all I need to do is I'll just need to generalize the solution. So the solution to this equation will be nt plus x1 and nt plus x2 where n belongs to an integer. So say for example suppose I have 2 times fraction part of x square minus 5 times fraction part of x plus 2 equals to 0. I will let x belongs to 0 to 1. So between 0 to 1 fraction part of x is simply x so I can write it as 2x square minus 5x plus 2 equals to 0. So this is 2x minus 1. This is x minus 2 equals to 0. So I'll get two values. x is 1 by 2 or x is simply 2. Now 2 doesn't lie in 0 comma 1. So the only answer to this question in the interval 0 to 1 is x is equal to 1 by 2. Now I need to generalize the solution. So I'll generalize it as the value of x should be n plus 1 by 2 where n belongs to z. So we can solve these fraction part questions taking the value of x between 0 and 1. But mind it any functional equation it has to be only a function of fraction part of x. There should be no other function of x. In the same way we can solve the inequalities using this periodic property. So suppose I have any inequality f fraction part of x suppose greater than 0. Now again what I'll do is I'll let x belongs to 0 to 1. I'll solve this condition. Whatever result I'll get suppose I get x belongs to x1 and x2 and this result it must lie within 0 comma 1 and then finally I will generalize it. So x belongs to nt plus x1 to nt plus x2. Now say for example now suppose the question is 2 times fraction part of x minus 1, fraction part of x minus 2, fraction part of x plus 3 and 3 minus 4 fraction part of x. So what I will do is I will let x belongs to 0 to 1. So now I can write it as 2x minus 1, x minus 2, x plus 3 and 3 minus 4x is greater than or equal to 0. So if I find the critical point, so it will be 1 by 2, 2 minus 3 and 3 by 4. So the values will be minus 3 and then 1 by 2 and then 3 by 4 and then 2. What is the sign of the rightmost? Sign of the rightmost is minus. So it will be minus plus minus plus and minus. I need what? Greater than 0. Greater than 0 is positive. Now 1 by 2 and 2 they will be included. And minus 3 and 4. 3 by 4 will not be included. Now this result it has come with the condition and the condition was the value of x should lie between 0 and 1. So the value of x should lie between 0 and 1. 0 included and 1 not included. So answer to this question will be x belongs to included 0 to included 1 by 2 union 3 by 4 to 1. Now I need to generalize it. So I can generalize it as x belongs to so its fundamental period is 1. So this is n to n plus 1 by 2 
union n plus 3 by 4 to n plus 1 where n belongs to integer. So, so in any question which involves just the fraction part function, see recall here also there is no other function except for fraction part of x. There is not even a single x other than fraction part of x. So in that case we can always find the solution between 0 and 1 and then because we know fraction part of x is a predictive function so we can generalize the result. So we can always generalize the result adding n to it. So this is from n to n plus 1 by 2 union n plus 3 by 4 to n plus 1. So this is how we use periodicity of fraction part function to solve equations and inequalities. Now the next transformation is from the graph of y equals to fx we have to draw the graph of y equals fractional part of x. So here this bracket represents fractional part function. Now say for example I have to draw the graph of y equals e to the power fraction part of x when x lies between suppose 0 and 3. So I'll draw the graph of e to the power x. So now what are the steps? Steps are draw the graph of y equals to fx between x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. So I'll just need to draw the graph between x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. So this is 0 and this is 1. So at 0 this value is what? 1 and at 1 this value is suppose e. So I'll draw the graph of e to the power x between 0 and 1. And here I won't include the value at 1. Now because fractional part function is a periodic function so all I need to do is I need to copy and paste this graph for all other intervals. So what I'll do is I'll copy and paste this entire graph. So that is the graph of y equals e to the power fraction part of x. I'll take up another example. Suppose I have to draw the graph of y equals ln fraction part of x. I'll draw the graph of ln x between 0 and 1 and I won't include it at 1. Now I'll generate the graph for all other intervals. So that is the graph of ln of fraction part of x. So now we'll come to our 15th transformation and that is graph of fraction part of y equals fx. So from the graph of y equals to fx, I have to draw the graph of the y equals fractional part of x. So I'll take up an example. Say for example, I have to draw the graph of y equals fractional part of x square when x lies between 0 and 2. So I'll draw this graph. So I'll draw the graph of y equals x square and then I'll draw dotted horizontal lines at integral values of y. And then I'll mark corresponding points on x. So this is 1. Now when y is 2, this is root 2. Here I'll be this as root 3. And here this value is 2. Now between two successive values of x, move graph vertically to bring it between y equals to 0 and y equals to 1. So all I need to do is I need to move the graph between two successive x so that the graph lies between 0 and 1. So it already lies between 0 and 1. Now this part, I'll bring it down. This part also I'll bring it down. This part also I'll bring it down. So that's the graph of y equals fraction part of x square. I'll take up another example. Say for example, I need to draw the graph of y equals fractional part of sine x when x lies between 0 and 2 pi. So I'll draw the graph of sine x. Now I'll draw horizontal lines at integral points. So I'll draw horizontal line at 1, 0, and minus 1 so this is 0 1 and minus 1 and I'll mark this point now when x is an integer then fraction part of x is 0 so for all these point I'll mark the corresponding point on x axis where it will be 0 so this is 0 
pi by 2 pi 3 pi by 2 and this is 2 pi now I'll shift the graph to move it up and down so here it already lies between 0 and 1 so I won't change it here this graph it lies between 0 and minus 1 so I'll move it up so if I'll move it up I'll get so the graph of fraction part of sin x will be so this is 0 pi by 2 pi 3 pi by 2 and this is 2 pi this is 1 so that's the graph of y equals fraction part of sin x so in this video we'll discuss a very interesting and important formula which is legendary's formula also known as d polygonx formula so the formula says suppose i have factorial n and i know i can express any number as any prime powers like 2 to the power a 3 to the power b 5 to the power c and suppose i have any prime number p and i need to find what is the exponent of prime number p in factorial n so when we need to find exponent of any prime number in a given factorial then we'll use legendary's formula or d polygonx formula so the formula says the exponent of prime number p in factorial n is given by greatest inner function of n upon p greatest inner function of n upon p square greatest inner function of n upon p cube and we'll continue and after some time this n upon p to the power r it will be less than 1 so in all such successive cases in that case and plus all successive cases its value will be 0 so we'll have restricted number of cases say for example suppose I have factorial 5 and factorial 5 as we know is 120 2 cube into 3 into 5 now suppose I want to find exponent of 2 in factorial 5 so we'll be given by 5 upon 2 5 upon 2 square 5 upon 2 cube so 5 by 2 is 2.5 5 by 4 is 1.25 and then this value will be less than 1 so all successive values will be 0 so greatest inner function of 2.5 is 2 and greatest inner function of 1.25 is 1 so the exponent of 2 in factorial 5 will be 3 so we will use this formula to find exponent of some prime number p in factorial n now how do we use this formula so what are the questions that we are likely to get in this so let us take up another question which is find the number of zeros at the end of factorial 108 now what I know is again I can write factorial 108 as some 2 to the power a 3 to the power b and 5 to the power c and when this 2 gets multiplied with 5 I'll get this value as 10 so if I have to find number of zeros at the end of 108 factorial then I have to find exponent of 2 and I'll also have to find exponent of 5 so if I have to find exponent of 2 in factorial 108 so what I'll do is I'll write 108 by 2 108 by 2 square 108 by 2 cube 108 by 2 to the power 4 108 2 to the power 5 108 2 to the power 6 108 to the power 7 and go on now this is 54 this is 27 13.5, and then it will be 0 0.8 something. So after this, it will all be 0. So I'll simply write it as 
54 plus 27 plus 13 plus 6 plus 3 and plus 1. So which is 104. 10 and that is 40. So 50, 50 and 54 is 104. Now we'll find exponent of 5. So exponent of 5 in factorial 108. So there will be 108 by 5. 108 by 5 square and 108 by 5 cube. So there will be 21.6 and then 21.6 divided by 5 4.72 and then all the values will be 0. So there will be 21 plus 4. So there will be 25. So in this 108 factorial, I'll have 2 to the power 104 and then I'll also have 5 to the power 25 because the number of 5 is limited. So 25 times this 5 gets multiplied with 2. So I'll get 10 to the power 25. So in the end, there'll be 25 zeros in factorial 108 or there'll be 25 zeros at the end of factorial 108. So the question is find the exponent of 7 and 100 C 50. Now what I know is 100 C 50 is actually factorial 100, factorial 50 into factorial 50. So what I'll do is I'll find exponent of 7 in factorial 100 and I'll also find exponent of 7 in factorial 50. So for factorial 100 will be 100 by 7. 100 by 7 square, 100 by 7 cube, and go on. Now, 100 by 7 is nearly 14.28 something. Then, this is 2.4 something. And then, this value, it is less than 1, so then it will be 0. So, it will simply be 14 plus 2, that is 16. So, exponent of 7 in factorial 100 is 16. So I can write it as, so it'll have 7 to the power 16 in the numerator. Now, what about exponent of 7 in factorial 50? In factorial 50, I can write it as 50 by 7, 50 by 7 square, 50 by 7 cube, it'll go on. Now this is 7 point something. So this is 7. Now 50 by 49 is simply 1, and then all of the values, they'll be 0. So this is simply 8. So the exponent of 7 factorial 50 is 8. So here I'll have 7 to the power 8. And here also I'll have 7 to the power 8. So basically 7 to the power 16 will get cancelled with 7 to the power 8 and 7 to the power 8. So in 100 C50, there'll be no exponent of 7. So exponent of 7 in 100 C50 will be simply 0. Now there'll be questions in binomial theorem where we need to use greatest near function and fractional part function to solve certain problems. Say for example, a question is given as x equals 8 plus 3 root 7 to the power n, where n is a natural number and this uh, box represents greatest near function. So it says prove that the integral part of this binomial expression is an odd integer and also we need to find the value of x minus x square plus x into greatest near function of x. Now here what I'll do is, I'll take this x common. So if I'll take x common, I can write x and it is 1 minus, I'll take minus also common. So this is x minus greatest in the function of x. So x minus greater function of x is nothing but its fraction part of x. So I need to find x into 1 minus fractional part of x. Now in this question, we have both greatest in function as well as fractional part function. So what do we do in this question is, I'll write this 8 plus 3 root 7 as greatest integer function of x plus fractional part of x. And I'll write fractional part of x as f. Now I know that in this case, the value of f will lie between 0 and 1 because it's not an integer. So this value, it will always have some fractional part and which will be between 0 and 1. Now, I'll take up another binomial expression, which is the conjugate of this expression. So I'll write 8 minus 
3 root 7 to the power n and I'll say this value is f. Now make sure when we are taking this conjugate of the given expression, this value 8 minus 3 root 7 to the power n, it should always lie between 0 and 1. Now we know that 8 plus 3 root 7 into 8 minus 3 root 7 is equal to 1. Now 8 minus 3 root 7 is 1 upon 8 plus 3 root 7. So this value is less than 1. So I can say that the value of capital F will lie between 0 and 1. So now if I'll expand these two series, I can write from the first one, I can write greatest linear function of x plus f is nc0 a to the power n nc1 a to the power n minus 1 3 under root 7 nc2 a to the power n minus 2 3 root 7 whole square and from the second series I can write f is nc0 a to the power n minus nc1 a to the power n minus 1 3 root 7 plus nc2 a to the power n minus 2 3 root 7 whole square. Now from these two series I need to cancel out the terms having under root sign. So in this case if I'm going to add the two series then these terms containing square root they'll get cancelled. So I'll add them up. So if I'll add them up I'll write greater function of x plus small f plus capital F there will be. So here it, this term will cancel. So I will get 2 times nc0 a to the power n nc2 a to the power n minus 2 into 3 under root 7 whole square. So whenever I have this irrational part, I am having an even power. So this expression on the right hand side, it is nothing but an even integer. Now, what about f plus f? What I know is the value of f lies between 0 and 1. The value of capital F also will lie between 0 and 1. So if I add them up, from here I can say the value of f plus f will lie between 0 and 2. Now, greatest linear function of x, it is an integer. Right hand side is also an integer. So it simply means the value of this f plus f, it should also be an integer. So the only integral value possible in this case is 1. So from here I can say value of f plus capital F, it should be 1. So that is greatest linear function of x plus 1. It should be an even integer. That is greatest linear function of x should be even integer minus 1. So there will be an odd integer. So from here we can say the greatest integer part for this given binomial expression is an odd integer. Now, we'll, if I look at the second part, the second part is simply, I need to find the value of x into 1 minus fraction part of x. So, this is x into 1 minus and we have taken this fraction part as f. So, 1 minus f. So, this is x and what I know is f plus f is 1. So, 1 minus small f is capital F. So, it is x into capital F. What is x? x is 8 plus 3 under root 7 to the power n and what is capital F? Capital F is 8 minus 3 under root 7 to the power n. So if I will multiply them, I will get what? 64 minus 63 to the power n which is 1. So answer to the second part is 1. So the value of this expression is nothing but 1. So let us take up another question which is find the value of 3 plus under root 5 to the power 5, it's greatest integer function. So I'll need to find integral value of this given binomial expression. So what I'll again do is, I'll write this as the greatest integer function of x plus small f as 3 plus under root 5 to the power 5. Now the value of f will always lie between 0 and 1. And now I'll take its conjugate. So its conjugate will be 3 minus under root 5 to the power 5 root 5 is 2.2 something so this value is less than 1 and any number which is less than 1 raised to the power 5 will also be less than 1 so the value of f will also lie between 0 and 1 so now I'll expand the given two binomial series so I'll write greatest linear function of x plus f is 5c0 3 to the power 5 root 5 to the power 0 5c1 
3 to the power 4 root 5 to the power 1 5c2 3 to the power 3 under root 5 square and 5c5 3 to the power 0 under root 5 to the power 5 and the next one will be capital F which is 5c0 3 to the power 5 under root 5 to the power 0 minus 5c1 3 to the power 4 under root 5 plus 5c2 3 to the power 3 under root 5 square and then finally it will be minus 5c5 3 to the power 0 under root 5 to the power 5. Now again I need to cancel the terms which contains square root. So I will add them up. So I will write get a function of f plus f and this is 2 times 5c0 3 to the power 5 5c2 3 cube under root 5 square and plus 5c4 3 to the power 1 under root 5 to the power 4. So now I know that the value of f lies between 0 and 1 and value of capital F also lies between 0 and 1. So the value of small f plus capital F will lie between 0 and 2. So I can write it as this is greatest in the function of x plus f plus f and this is 2 times. Now 3 to the power 5 will be 243 and this one will be 1350 and here will be 375. So if I multiply them, I will get this value as 3936. Now get a function of x, it is an integer. 3936 is also an integer. Now, what about f plus f? So, it will also be an integer. So, the only integral value really possible in this case is value of f plus f, it should be 1. So, if I will put this value here, I will get greatest in a function of x plus 1 is 3936. So, the value of greatest in a function of x is 3935. So, the value of greatest integer function of 3 to the power root 5 to the power 5 is 3, 9, 3, 5. Now we will take another question which is r equals 5 root 3 plus 8 to the power 2n plus 1 where f is r minus greatest integer function of r. I need to find the value of r into f. So again what I will do is I will write this as greatest integer function of r plus f and this is 5 root 3 plus 8 to the power 2n plus 1. And I write the minimal expansion, so which is 2n plus 1 c0, 5 root 3 to the power 2n plus 1, 8 to the power 0, 2n plus 1 c1, 5 root 3 to the power 2n, 8 to the power 1, and it will go on. And I also take its conjugate, so now its conjugate will be 5 root 3 minus 8 to the power 2n plus 1. 5 root 3 minus 8. Now 5 root 3 minus 8, this value is less than 1. So from here I can say the value of capital F will lie between 0 and 1. And we also know value of small f will also lie between 0 and 1. So if I will expand it, I will write 2n plus 1 c0. 5 root 3 to the power 2n plus 1. 8 to the power 0 minus 2n plus 1 c1. 5 root 3 to the power 2n into 8. So now again I need to cancel terms containing a square root. Now terms containing square root is 5 root 3 because it is an odd power. There will be the third term. So all I need to do in this case is I need to subtract them. So previously we have added them to cancel out a square root parts. Now we will subtract them. So if I will subtract it I will get r plus f minus f and there will be 2n plus 1 c1. 5 root 3 to the power 2n, 8 to the power 1, 2n plus 1 c3, 5 root 3 to the power 2n minus 2, there will be 8 cube. So now in each of this expression, it is an even power on the square root expression. So it is nothing but an even integer. So capital R plus f minus f. Now capital R, it is an integer. Right hand side is also an integer. 
So that means f minus f will also be an integer. But both the numbers, they lie between 0 and 1. So the only integral value possible in this case is the value of f minus f should be 0. So that is small f should be equal to capital F. Now I need to find the value of r into f. A small f is same as capital F. So there will be r into capital F. Now value of r is 5 root 3 plus 8 to the power 2n plus 1. And capital F is 5 root 3 minus 8 to the power 2n plus 1. So there will be 5 root 3 whole square. So that should be 75 minus 64 to the power 2n plus 1. So answer to this question will be 11 to the power 2n plus 1. So in this case, R will be an even integer. So greater function of R will be an even integer. And the value of R into F will be 11 to the power 2n plus 1. So now we'll discuss the most important questions in greatest linear function and fraction part function. And these questions involve both fraction part as well as greatest linear function part. Now these two functions, they have their own restrictions. So for greatest linear function, its value will always be an integer. And for fraction part, we know that any fraction part function will always lie between 0 and 1, where 0 is included and 1 is not included. So we'll have many questions where we need to use the properties or restrictions of greatest linear function and fraction part function to solve them. So these equations generally involve x, greatest linear function of x and fraction part of x. And we also know that I can write x as greatest linear function of x plus fraction part of x. So let us take up an example. Say for example, solve the equation which is two times greatest linear function of x is equal to x plus fraction part of x where this box x represents greatest linear function and this bracket represents fraction part function. So now what I will do is I will replace x. So I will let x as greatest linear function of x plus fraction part of x. So I will write 2 times greatest linear function of x and this is greatest linear function of x plus fraction part of x. So I will take it on the left hand side. So I will write the greatest linear function of x is 2 times fraction part of x or I will write fraction part of x as greatest linear function of x by 2. We will always try and express fraction part of x as some function of greatest linear function of x. Now what I know is this function it has a restriction that its value will always lie between 0 and 1. So what I will do is I know that fraction part of x will always lie between 0 and 1. So I can write greatest linear function of x by 2 will lie between 0 and 1. So I can say, so the value of greatest linear function will always lie between 0 and 2. Now we'll use the restriction of greatest linear function. Now any greatest linear function, it can only take integral values and no other values. So in this interval, the only values possible for greatest linear function are either greatest linear function is 0 or the value of greatest linear function of x is 1. So if the greatest linear function of x is 0, I'll put it here. I'll get fraction part of x. So it will be 0 upon 2, it will be simply 0. Now what is x? x is nothing but greatest linear function plus its fraction part. So 0 plus 0 is 0. So one of the solution to this equation is the value of x should be 0. Now when x is 1, so I'll put it here. So here the fraction part of x will be greater function of x by 2. So there will be 1 by 2. So again I'll add them up. I'll get x. So x will be 1 plus 1 by 2. So here in this case will be x is 3 by 2. So there are two solutions possible in this case. Either the value of x is 0 or the value of x is 3 by 2. So let us give another question which is 4 times fraction part of x is x plus greatest linear function of x. So again what I'll do is I'll replace this x. So I'll write 4 times fraction part of x and this is greatest linear function of x plus fraction part of x plus greatest linear function of x. So I'll take fraction part here. So this is 3 times fraction part of x is 2 times greatest linear function of x. So I'll write fraction part of x as a function of greatest linear function of x. Now again this function is restricted. Its value will lie between 0 and 1. So fraction part of x lies between 0 and 1. So 0 and this is 2 times greatest linear function of x and 3 and 1. So if I'll take this number on the left and right, I'll write greatest linear function of x will lie between 0 and 3 by 2. So now greatest linear function, it can only take 
integral values. So the only integral values possible in this case are so either the value of greatest function is 0 or the value of greatest integral function of x is 1 because it is 0 and 1.5. So if greatest integral function of x is 0, if I put it here, I'll get fraction part of x is 0. So now what is the value of x? x is greatest integral part plus its fraction part. 0 plus 0 is simply 0. So one of the solution is x equals to 0. Now if I put greatest integral function of x is 1, I can write fraction part of x is 2 by 3. Now again, if I'll add them up, I'll get x which is 1 plus 2 by 3, which is 5 by 3. So there are two solutions to this equation. Either the value of x is 0 or the value of x is 5 by 3. So now the question is greatest near function of x plus 2 into fraction part of minus x is equal to 3x. So again, we'll start with, we'll write this x as fraction part of x plus greatest near function of x. So I'll write it as greatest near function of x and this is 2 times fraction part of minus x and this is 3 times greatest linear function of x plus fraction part of x. So if I take this greater function on the right hand side, I can write 2 times fraction part of minus x is 3 times, so it's 3 and minus 1, so there will be 2 times greatest linear function of x plus 3 times fraction part of x. Now this question, it is like little different from the previous question. Here in this question, we also have fraction part of minus x. Now what do we do in this case? Now I cannot simply take fraction part of x and there's no way I can take this minus sign out. So the property that I know is fraction part of x plus fraction part of minus x, it is 0 when they are integers and it is 1 when x is not an integer. So here I need to take two separate cases. Case 1, when I'll assume my x is an integer on the second case when I'll say when x is not an integer. Now when x is an integer, what I know fraction part of minus x will be 0 and fraction part of x will also be 0. So from here I'll get 0 and it is 2 times greatest linear function of x plus 0. So here the result I'll get is greatest linear function of x is 0. So x belongs to 0 comma 1 but the condition is x should be an integer so the only integer possible in this case is x is equal to 0. So if x is an integer the only solution to this equation is the value of x should be 0. Now when x is not an integer I know that fraction part of x plus fraction part of minus x is 1 so I can write fraction part of minus x as 1 minus fraction part of x. So what I'll do is I'll substitute it in the equation so it is 2 into 1 minus fraction part of x that is 2 into greatest near function of x plus 3 into fraction part of x. Now I'll take this fraction part function and I'll express it as a function of greatest near function. So I'll write it as 2 minus 2 into greatest near function of x and there will be 5 times fraction part of x. So I'll write it as fraction part of x as 2 into 1 minus greatest near function of x divided by 5. Now again we will use the restriction of fraction part of x. So we know that the value of fraction part of x lies between 0 and 1. So it will be 0, 2, 1 minus greatest linear function of x upon 5 should lie between 0 and 1. So if I will cross multiply I will write 0, 1 minus greatest linear function of x is less than 5 by 2. I will subtract 1. So I will write minus 1 is less than equal to minus greatest near function of x is less than 3 by 2. So I'll multiply it with the minus sign. So it'll be minus 3 by 2 and then greatest near function of x is less than or equal to 1. So it is minus 1.5 greatest near function of x and 1. So the integral values possible in this case are, so either the value of x is minus 1 or this value is 0 or the value of greatest new function of x is 1. Now if I will put greatest new function of x is minus 1, I will write it as fraction part of x will be, so 2 there will be 4 by 5. So if I will add them, I will get the value of x as minus 1 plus 4 by 5. In this case the value of x will be minus 1 by 5. 
Now what if I put greater function of x is 0? So if I put greater single function of x is 0, I'll get fraction part of x as 2 by 5. So if I'll add them, now my x will be integer part plus fraction part. So then I'll get x as 2 by 5. What if greater function of x is 1? So if greatest function of x is 1, so in that case, it'll be 1 minus 1, there'll be 0. So there'll be fraction part of x is equal to 0. So in this case, the value of x will, will be 1. Now, we clearly know that in this case, x cannot be an integer. So I'll accept this solution. I'll accept the second one also, but I'm going to discard the third solution. So there are three answers possible in this case. And the solution to this equation is either the value of x is 0 or the value of x is minus 1 by 5 or the value of x is 2 by 5. So the number of solutions to this equation is simply 3. So we'll discuss another problem. The problem is 3x plus 5 fraction part of x equals 4 times. Now greatest integer function of 2x plus 3. So again what I'll do is I'll replace this x. I'll write 3 times the greatest integer function of x plus fraction part of x. And this is 5 times fraction part of x. 4 and then 2x plus 3. So I can write it as 3 times greatest integer function of x. Now 3x plus 5x will be 8 times fraction part of x. 4 times greatest integer function of 2x plus 3. Now here we have a problem because here we have both greatest integer function of x and greatest integer function of 2x. Now I cannot take this 2 out from greater function. So what I need to do is I will let greatest in the function of x as n. So that means the value of x should lie between n and n plus 1, where n is an integer. Now when the value of x lies between n and n plus 1, if I'll multiply it by 2, then the value of 2x will lie between 2n and 2n plus 2. So that means I have to take two separate cases. Case 1, when 2x lies between 2n and 2n plus 1 and the second case when the value of 2x lies between 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 2. Now in the first case I know that greatest function of x will be n and I also know that greatest function of 2x will be simply 2n. So if I put this value in the equation I will get it as 3 greatest function of x will be simply n. So this is 8 fraction part of x. So this is 4 into 2n plus 3. So I can write it as fraction part of x will be 8 minus 3, 5. So 5n plus 3 by 8. Now fraction part of x will lie between 0 and 1. So here I'll write 0. 5n plus 3 is less than 8. So minus 3 by 5 and then it will be simply 1. So the only possible value in this case, the only possible integer value in this case will be 0. So that is the value of greatest integer function of x will be 0. Now if I will put the value of n as 0, I will get fraction part of x as 3 by 8. So if I will add them up, then the value of x will be simply 3 by 8. So but the solution to this equation is the value of x should be 3 by 8. I'll take up the second case. Now in the second case, greatest function of 2x will be simply 2n plus 1. So if I put it in the equation, I can write it as 3. This is n plus 8 times fraction part of x. This is 4 into 2n plus 1 and then plus 3. So I can write fraction part of x as so this is 8n minus 3n, so that is 5n plus 7, divide by 8. And now, again, fraction part of x will lie between 0 and 1. So from here, again, I can write 0, 5n plus 7, and this is 8. So this is minus 7, this is 5n, and this is 1. So minus 7 by 5 is less than n, is less than 1 by 5 only possible integral value of n again will be 0. So if I will put again n as 0, I will get this fraction part of x as 7 by 8. Now any x is integer part plus fraction part. So in this case it will be 7 by 8. So 
there are two solutions to this equation either the value of x is 3 by 8 or the value of x is 7 by 8. If you like the video, consider subscribing and sharing it with someone you know who might benefit from it. Also, the best way to navigate any topic is through a playlist. Simply go to the channel page, click playlist and select the topic you wish to study.